Welcome back to the Placeholder Podcast, everybody. I'm Kaylee Fretz. I'm back from a little bit of leave. It's 2024. It's our first episode of the year. We have a super fun podcast for you today. Unfortunately, we're going to kick off here with a tragic story instead. Joining me today, Abby Mickey. Hello. And well done filling in while I was gone. I appreciated that. You too, Johnny Long. Johnny did most of the heavy lifting. I enjoyed it. Turns out, just do a pub quiz and you can put it online as a podcast. I really enjoyed it. I was listening to it uh, in sort of on a long ski ahead of Christmas, and giggling to myself throughout. So I'm sure I looked like an absolute nutcase out in the woods. Finally, Ronan McLaughlin, welcome to the show. Speaking of Thank nutcases. <laughs> oh, the, the quiz was not my brightest moment, no. It wasn't. And you've got a giant beard, which I feel like we should tell the, the audience about. It's growing every day. Hmm. Every and second. I I'm like. not every sure if it's a beard or if it's just this like ball patch at the top. It's the hair is actually growing in reverse. <laughs> it stopped coming out at the back of my head and it started coming out at the bottom front of my head. It's really unfortunate that this is not a visual medium because mm. all the listeners out there, you're missing, you're missing out. You're missing out. Well, like I said, we've got a great and fun show for you today, but the first segment is not great and not fun in any way. It is tragic and we don't want to spend a ton of time on this. Mostly because, Abby, you're going to be spending a lot more time on it on Wheel Talk next week. But it is, I guess, worth a little bit. I don't even know how to talk about this. Well, Abby, since, like I said, you're, you're going to be talking about this much next week on Wheel Talk, uh, a couple of your co-hosts, your former teammates of Melissa Hoskins, tell us what happened. Yeah, I think there's not a ton that we know at the moment. Uh, more news is kind of trickling out every day, and I think... We will understand it more in the coming months as there will be a trial. But there was an incident over the holiday break involving Rowan Dennis and his wife, Melissa Dennis, formerly Hoskins, who's a Olympian, Olympic medalist um, on the track and a longtime member of uh, the Green Edge organization. Um, tragically, she passed away and... In the days afterwards, Rowan was charged with with her death, and I think that the yeah the the details of that there's a lot kind of floating around on the internet and a lot of speculation that is kind of running rampant on the internet. But I think it's really important to say that we we really don't know the the details of it, and there's a little bit that the police have been able to suss out, but it's not been made public. And I think what's really important right now in this situation is to respect Melissa, their family, and and the, their kids, their two kids, really young kids that she's left behind. As Kaylee mentioned, Gracie and Lauren were both teammates with Melissa. Gracie was her teammate for three years, and they they went to the Olympics together, the um, up track versus road, but... They spent some time together, so Gracie talks a bit about her as a person in the in the episode next week in, of Wheel Talk, and we don't really di- dive into the details of the incident because I think, I mean, especially for the three of us, it's so tragic that none of us really want to talk about it. But it is news that has been kind of blowing up in the cycling world because it's a small world and if we remember what happened with uh, Mo Wilson in 2022 and that incident this is arguably more uh, shocking and devastating to the cycling world um, just because of the nature of the situation and as as you can imagine it's it's been an, a pretty insane situation that's happened to the cycling world and to Australia, Australia as well in general. Um, so the outpouring of support for Melissa and the incredible comments that people have had to make, make about her have been like really tragic and also incredible to see. Um, she was, as everyone will tell you, the life of the party and incredibly loyal to anyone who, who was close to her. And yeah, the whole thing is just unimaginable. Yeah, and, and I guess as a, as a news organization, we will be covering this story. We feel like we have an obligation to bring you information, audience out there. But at the moment, like Abby said, frankly, there's, there's not enough firmed to have us as journalists feel like we can talk in too much detail about it. We're not going to go, you know, 
the Escape Collective is not a tabloid. We're not going to go, you know, run the photos that popped up of Rowan Dennis walking out of his house. That sort of thing. That's that's not who we are. And but we will endeavor to to cover this story with utmost care. And I think the first thing to do there is really center the victim in all this, who is Melissa. And so that's why Abby and Gracie and Lauren are going to chat about it next week. So make sure that you pull up the Wheel Talk podcast next week. Let's take a brief break. Welcome back, everybody. Let's bring things up a little bit, hopefully. Uh, we're we're going to kick off with a bunch of news items here. We have a whole list for you. And then later in the show, uh, we're going to, frankly, it's it's a flagrant ripoff of another podcast that I listen to. Uh, we're going to do some New Year's resolutions, pro cycling. I think it's a fun little segment. We'll get to that at the end. But first, news. So, Spitgate. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I was deep in newborn land while this was happening. So, Johnny, tell me what's going on right now. Christ, I mean, I didn't have a newborn child, but um, I was also not really paying attention to cycling over Christmas. <laughs> sort of, uh, you know, cyclocross tends to pass me by, apart from like when I see like a photo of someone submerged in mud, like on Instagram, and then I'm like, okay, that's fun, that's it. Um, effectively, Ma- uh, Matthew van der Poel, I think it was at the World Cup round in Hulst, maybe? He's riding through like the finishing straight and there's uh he like sort of turns his head to the left and you can just see sort of like phlegm and spittle just erupt from his mouth in the direction of a fan at the side of the road who was giving him abuse and then there was also accusations that they'd thrown urine on him um it was like a you could see that uh flying through the air so it was a bit of a not a nice scene um definitely beer De- he definitely got beer thrown on him was there, because then there was something where he retweeted a tweet. I hate how this is like reporting in, in the modern age. He retweeted a tweet uh, about the, about urine you being thrown X. on him on X. Yeah. yeah. There was yeah. beer, there was beer in the urine. Yeah. It, it's, it was definitely beer, but allegedly beer. there was urine okay. as well. Like a new craft beer sort of collaboration. Okay. Um, I mean, <laughs> it could have been Bud Light, in which case it's both. <laughs> Uh, wasn't the issue his recent dominance? Wasn't that the, the oh, is that the, the stated booing? reason? And, well, I, I don't think there was a stated reason because whoever did this presumably didn't come forward and say I threw urine over Matthew Van Der Poel <laughs> because I don't like him winning seven races in a row. But if I understand correctly, uh, there's a, a bit of displeasure at the fact that he is literally dominating every race he turns up to. Yeah, fans in that part of the world are also quite a bit more sort of partisan than I think that particularly we're we're used to here in the United States where you know like when 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 the world championships came to the US most recently you know everybody gets cheered everyone's everyone's cheering for every single mm. rider uh in Belgium and the Netherlands and in Belgium in particular I think you know when the wrong rider goes past it's just silent right Ooh, very kind of creepy. odd and so yeah so people kind of sit like on either side of the fence it's much more like maybe a ball sport or something like that and so you do end up with these kind of like oh I'm a fan of Lars Vanderhaar instead, <laughs> and and then you you know you get kind of kind of angry hooligan fans that do things like this. I'm trying to remember what year it was, but it was, it was Sven Nice. I remember that because it was sort of at the peak of his powers, and he actually got off his bike and like chased a fan around. Oh yeah, I've for a while, that. like got off and ducked under the tape and like chased a fan around for a while, and, <laughs> and basically like told him to stop, stop chucking stuff at him. So th- th- there is and probably still precedent. won the race. Probably still the race. There is precedent for this this sort of thing. It is also kind of part of, of cyclocross. If it was beer, let's say if it was beer and not piss, you know, Vanderpool's reaction may be, may be less than ideal. But if, it, if it's piss, I feel like this is just my personal opinion here. If you get piss thrown out of you, I think you get to spit back. Do you guys mm-hmm. agree with that? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. No, I don't know. Mm. Just Come spit, on. Spitting Come is on. just so like, it's just like... So unbecoming. Yeah, but Johnny, if you you're covered, I mean? in, like, if you're covered in someone's urine, uh, yeah, all, <laughs> all bets are off at that yeah, point. But as a, as a professional athlete, like as a professional athlete who has people who look up to him and and is kind of a a model in some sense, then you can't just go spitting on people. It should be uh, someone else's task to reprimand the person who threw urine on Matthew Vanderpool than himself. Matthew Vanderpool needs an official spitter. Is that someone to follow yeah, around? Yeah, just someone to, to follow him people? around and spit on people when they throw things at him. Yeah. 
He should have just um, chased them back into their hotel room while he was only wearing his underwear. Oh. And, uh, oh. them the <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, uh. You're you you right, though, Abby. Like, as, 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 as crap as it is for Vanderpool, he, when you're watching that on TV as a young and influence, uh, influenceable kid, all you see is Vanderpool reacting in the way he did. Maybe and you yes, don't have access when, to Twitter. You don't know hmm. that he's been having things thrown on him. Well, regardless of whether you do or not, I think, you know, in future, if you've seen the biggest and best cyclist in the world do that, uh, and, you know, it happens to you in a couple of years' time when you're a little bit older, perhaps you react in the same way. And unfortunately, while we shouldn't be holding, you know, riders of any caliber, professional, amateur, the best in the world, the worst in the world, whatever, to different standards, unfortunately, I think there is an element of that and when you're televised and your actions are so visible. Can we talk about how hard it would be to Not spit to. accurately on oh. somebody as you're racing cyclocross at like 30k an hour? He I mean, was that's, winning just sort of genuinely by impressive. minutes, though. Wasn't he winning by Truly. minutes? Like he's got a second to kind of eye who uh, uh, like make <laughs> eye contact mm. with the guy that it was he's about seamless. To spit on. It was it seamless, was, yeah. like it was one fell sweep of spit, yeah. Having, having done a bit of cyclocross as well, I, I can tell you I struggle to remember <laughs> I where... I going to say having where, done some spinning. I mean, I have spat, but not I at someone. I wouldn't be surprised at all. <laughs> I was going to say, having done a bit of cyclocross, I found it difficult to remember where the trees to avoid were. Uh, never, <laughs> never mind actually spot who was throwing stuff at me and remember where they were in the course and then pick them out on the next lap. That, that was particularly impressive. Hmm. I was going to say, this, is this the most impressive physical feat that he had that day, which was that he was winning by so much that he could just like hang out for a while and spit on people? No, I think there's an extra layer to that. He was winning by so much, so comfortably, he was able to spot who did this and then take revenge. <laughs> all right. Okay, all jokes aside, though, all jokes aside, I think it is like, whilst you can say, okay, the spitters or the urine throwers possible alleged urine throwers were in the wrong for harassing Matthew Vanderpool while he was racing. Just like in Australia, Vanderpool reacted with, with something that was just not a good look. Like, I don't know, maybe he just needs to take some breath lessons or something, but his reaction is unsavory. Yeah. Agreed. Nobody comes out looking good you on know, this one. You know what else is unsavory? Did you see that big gold supercar that he drove in? Uh, yeah, that was, oh, God. Really I mean, if we if we want to rank like the things that Matthew Van der Poel has done wrong, like that was just <laughs> it's his true like villain era, like that like spitting on someone and then turning up in like a whatever that was like a Lamborghini or something. I think it was a Lambo, and I think it was so it was a rear engine car. So then he was pulling yeah. things out of the trunk, which I don't know why, but so something about pulling your out gear out of the front of the car yeah, the feels bonnet. particularly villainous to me. Yeah. It's like I don't, um, I don't know why. It's it's like uh, it's not enough to have like a really expensive car. It's like to to showcase your money, you have to like do things back to front. There you, you go. Know. You have the title of our of this podcast episode, which is Matthew Vanderpool is in his villain era. Oh, okay. I like it. I like it. All right, we're we're, we're gonna move on. We're gonna move on. Uh, I think the 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 consensus here at the Placeholder Podcast is that Matthew Vanderpool shouldn't spit on Spitting people, and bad. also no one should. Spitting is bad, and no one should throw piss and or beer at bike racers that they don't like. Both of those things are, are <laughs> negatives. Let's move on to, announced this morning, Red Bull has bought a 51%, so the majority stake in Bora Hansgrohe. Johnny, what's going on here? So this became public knowledge because uh, like a, a notice or document appeared on the website of the Austrian... Oh, I've already forgotten the Boron acronym. Basically, like the Competitions Authority of, of Austria, because Red Bull is an, an Austrian company. Bora Hansgrohe have, as like mid us recording this podcast, have released a statement on the planned partnership with Red Bull, as they, as they describe it. Uh, the statement says, Red Bull strives to complement the team's portfolio of existing long-term main sponsors who will remain on a long-term basis. So that seems to suggest that Bora Hansgrohe will remain... Bora hands grow, maybe Red Bull Bora hands grow. And what it means in real terms is that after sort of flirting with getting involved in cycling over the past few years with various rider, riders wearing Red Bull helmets, you know, your, your Wout Van Arts, your Pauline Ferron Prevost, Tom Pidcox, even Anton Pauzer, the, the ski mountaineer, who now rides for Red Bull uh, because of his VO2 max sort of scores. But they're now going to the actually monster. own a, a team, effectively. 
Um, so you, you'd assume that means big financial investment uh, to sort of maybe bring Bora up to the level of UAE, Yumbo and Ineos. Um, they've had a partnership for a while, like they've been doing sort of academy stuff and had like performance centre access, that sort of thing. But the fact that this comes after sort of the arrival of Primoz Roglic, I think is probably the most interesting thing. Is it is it because they've now got a rider of that sort of calibre in terms of GC rider that they, they felt this was time to strike? But details are still scarce. So we don't know if they will become Red, like a Red Bull co-title team or... Hmm. Uh, the Roglic one is particularly interesting because at the time he was... Wasn't he spotted at like a Red Bull... HQ or something before he was announced with yeah. Bora. So did Roglic come first or did Red Bull come first or which we're, I'm sure mm. time will tell eventually for that. But I think uh, having done quite a bit of research into Red Bull in the past and how they work, I think it's particularly interesting for me because if you think about Red Bull, obviously this is a drinks company, but well, I don't know how far down this rabbit hole to go, but briefly speaking, Red Bull don't actually make drinks. They outsource the manufacture of their anti-sleep uh, performance aiding drink uh, to some other company. Uh, it's also on one of the Red Bull Formula One cars. But anyway, what what Red Bull do instead is effectively focus on the the marketing of that drink, and they've been incredibly successful in that. In 2019, they sold something like seven and a half billion cans of Red Bull, which is effectively one for every person on the planet, and that generated a revenue of something like six billion dollars. So they're incredibly a uh, wealthy company, but they spend up to a third of that on marketing. If you compare that to other huge multinationals who spend 1% or 2% of their revenue on marketing, the fact that Red Bull spends around about 30% just shows you how invested they are in, in marketing their drink. You know, Until now, that's looked like, well, they've, they own two Formula 1 teams, they own four football teams, uh, they own a NASCAR team, an ice hockey team, clothing label, and a record label also, I think. So they, they don't get into the typical we are a big brand we will sponsor your sporting team x amount of dollars and you will wear, wear our brand name what they tend to do is they actually buy into sporting teams and, and other things instead they still get that advertising space that they would have got by sponsoring a team but they also get all the sort of owned media that comes with that so like they generate all their in-house uh, promotional work they do all the filming for all the events they they own all of that but on top of that, especially with the likes of the Formula 1 teams and the football teams, they can monetize those teams. And so something like when the budget cap came into Formula 1 a couple of years ago and limited their spending to something like $140 million per year, that was a Santa gift to Red Bull because <laughs> suddenly they, they, Formula One's, the interest in Formula 1 peaked globally. They could sell all of this advertising space on the advertising space that they owned rather than just being another advertiser paying to be on it. And as such, they can monetize... The, they, they effectively, instead of buying space on the billboard, they buy the billboard and then they sell the space as well as putting their own name on it. And so I think that's why it's interesting with Bora is because they've only bought a 51%. Okay, it's a majority of the team, but they haven't bought the team outright. I wonder is that, it could be doing two things. When they bought Leipzig or Red Bull Leipzig 10, 15 years ago, there was a rule in Germany that no company can own more than 49% of a football club because football is supposed to be for the people. Now, Red Bull found a way around that, uh, rebranded the team that they bought, RB Leipzig, took them from like literally nowhere in German fifth football. Division. To, to Yeah, fifth division to the Bundesliga in seven years and they've been, one of the, they haven't won a trophy since, but they've yeah. been huge since then. They did yeah. the same with uh, SV Salzburg or SV Austria, I can't remember, but they, they, RB, mm. RB Salzburg is the new team. They bought that team Again, that team had won like three championships in 70 years and they've won 10 of the 12 since Red Bull bought them. So you could say that's a real good thing. But what they also did was they came in, bought the team. They effectively said, look, that club that you used to support doesn't exist anymore. This is an entirely new club. Um, pissed off a whole lot of fans. So yeah, sort of yin and yang stuff to, to what they're, they're doing with uh, their sporting teams. But I think the, the Bora one, the other, the other possibility with the Bora one is that Bora and Hansgrohe obviously have sponsorship contracts in place. Perhaps there was something there that those contracts need to run their course before Red Bull can can entirely take over the organization or something. I don't know. But, you know, again, it's a, they have had cyclists in the past with Red Bull helmets. Um, but another part of what Red Bull does with their sporting teams is that they, especially with the football teams, they have like a feeder team system. So they have a team in Brazil, a team in Austria, a team in Germany, and a team in New York. And a player could spend their whole team 
contracted the Red Bull, working their way through those like four <laughs> hierarchies of teams. There's three hierarchies and then go to New York for their sort of retirement shindig. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and likewise with their other teams, they kind of use, rather than trying to go out and find an athlete to sponsor like White Van Aert or like Tom Pidcock, they may well now look at Bora and go, well, we've got Bora development team, we've got the Red Bull Brothers or whatever that development thing that they set up, the Talent ID mm-hmm. thing is. That could form the basis. Like it's a much longer play, but that could form the basis for the Red Bull cycling athletes in the years to come. It's like it's their own in house talent ID program. They identify the talent very young, get it in, get it signed to Red Bull, take it through their performance center, stick a Red Bull helmet on their heads. You know, it, it, it works out. Red Bull gets the athlete from a young age, but also the athlete gets all the resources that a Red Bull athlete gets to avail of. I think it's definitely a long play because, well, for uh, one of the big things for me is that. Cycling teams don't actually have any value. Mm. We've heard this from Jonathan Botters a couple different times. So buying 51% of a team, like what does that even mean? I mean, Botters has basically said the value of these teams is basically in their, it's like in their infrastructure. It's like the buses they own and the buildings they own and things like that. But there's, Which Red Bull is not interested not, in. Yeah, th- th- there's, there's not a whole lot else there. So, so like the way that these things tend to work and like the way that EF buying Slipstream, for example, worked was that it was, it was essentially a sort of a, you own the team now, but the actual cash is coming in the future as as like sort of future sponsorship, right? So you're going to run the team for X amount of millions of dollars for X amount of years. Like that, that's the way that those things are structured. So that's my guess around this is that, you know, they buy, they quote unquote, buy 51% for probably a relatively nominal sum. But then the expectation there is, okay, well, you own the thing. So you're going to dump a bunch of your own money into it. And, you know, Ralph Dank doesn't have to go searching for additional sponsors over and over and over and over and over again because Red Bull is now the, the primary owner. They're going to be the primary financial backer going forward. I don't know, like if, if you're used to, for example, like European football and people buying and selling those teams for, you know, hundreds of millions to billions of dollars, that's not what happened here. Like Ralph Dank probably didn't sell 51% for $100 million or whatever that number would be. It's cycling, so like a million dollars probably. It's more like investment into the future for that program i think i I know it's an entirely different scale but when dietrich madichet bought the jaguar formula one squad and team in 2004 he paid one euro for it or one pound okay they spent hundreds of millions over the following seasons to develop it into what it is now but and likewise with i can't remember what the team is called is it new york rebels or Rebels, rebels yeah when red bull acquired that they they paid like 25 million for it and i think that was around about the same era 2004 something like that and it was recently valued at like 290 million mm. um so they have this habit of like or this ability to you know spot potential and develop it and while cycling teams have no value at the moment or no real value or no value of interest to red bull i kind of wonder what the way things are going with you know first of all any us coming in and then uae and bahrain and the sort of the other investment that has come into cycling in mm. recent terms if there's some sort of shift happening there of course there's a lot that needs to happen and cycling can probably never actually figure itself out to be able to make those things happen. But perhaps there is value developing that we don't see quite quite yet. And, and the, other, the other thing is just for Red Bull, as a lowly sold a can for every person on the planet a few years ago, if I understand correctly, drink sales have, if not decreased, if the, the growth has certainly slowed as people sort of become more aware of Max Verstappen. maybe this... Uh, well, I was going to say, as people become more aware that maybe Red Bull isn't the healthiest thing you could possibly be drinking, uh, and it gives you wings diabetes. Di- di- no, it doesn't. <laughs> it gives you wings. Um, <laughs> a, a lawsuit uh, was successful in in claiming that or proving that they did not give you wings, and so they could not say that. But <laughs> that that did actually go to court, and that did actually happen. So that's why it's W I A A N G S now instead of wings. Yeah, I think Red Bull's just sort of diversifying into multiple or other sort of revenue streams and value options for when the time comes that, you know, drinks aren't as their their mm. their sort of cash cow or whatever you want to call it. It's it's like their version of um sort of the petro states having to diversify, diversify away from oil revenue. But then compared to like European football where they're seen as sort of the bad guys coming in with the the bad money. Red Bull coming into cycling where it's either Ineos <laughs> or like 
Bahrain or UAE, like they're then seen as the good money. So maybe that's that's a ploy is being like, oh, we're associated with like a healthy activity and we are, it's like Lidl coming in. Like everyone mm-hmm. likes that because it's like a proper company that sells something and family you, brand. You, yeah, when you, and you, and like you're, when you see Red Bull, you're like, oh, well, all you're trying to do is sell more energy drinks. And while they're not the best thing in the world, you know, it's better than sort of, well, auto, autocratic Re- states put like sponsoring Tade Pogaccia. Red Bull did annoy a lot of, you know, sort of long term fans of the football clubs that they acquired. But it's hard to argue that they didn't do good for those clubs also. Like they, yeah, well, that East uh, Le- Leipzig, so, there's like a, I think it was quite a poor East German area. And then now that mm. football club's worth like half a billion uh, and sort of like rejuvenated area. I'm like, you know, probably this part gentrification and people would argue they didn't want that. But there's, there are, there's, there are worse there's one other, on. There's one other piece to this puzzle is that now when you've got the likes of Keane Oudebrooks, uh, yeah, signed sign for almost nothing. Uh, yeah. Sold for presumably quite a bit. You know that is exactly what Red Bull have done with countless players who have come through Salzburg mm-hmm. and the likes. So perhaps that's where the future value is in cycling. Here's my sort of like follow up question and the final question here, which is: Is this now another cycling super team? And is Kian Utbrooks going to regret his decision that he made this fall? Because it seems. I mean, based off everything we've seen Red Bull do in other sports, it seems pretty likely to me that, that Bora Hansgrohe in the next couple of years is going to have a lot of cash. And not only a lot of cash, but a lot of sort of logistical support mm. that has made these programs very successful. Probably looking at potentially, I would put a decent amount of money on this team being the super team three to five years from now. It's like a reverse Ineos. Like they come into sports and projects and make them better. <laughs> I think that that's, the, it's, it's, that's a joke, but also a fact. Like the team might, yeah. they they might struggle to develop a cycling team more so than they would with like a football club or a Formula One team because it's there's so much resistance in cycling to progress or <laughs> stability. <Wait>. Really? <laughs> so, um, give me one example. <laughs> So Abby, what no, you're... seriously, like, it, it, is is this the new super team? That's the that's the. What do you guys mm. think? No. Two two years from now. Three yes. years from now. Yes. 100%, I, yes. I think <laughs> yes, but it's not the team we see now. I think there will be a lot of changes there. And very very positive news. I have zero doubt that that hideous kit that we've just seen Bora unveil will be changed in the very yes. near future. Uh, so that probably is the biggest positive to come out of all of this. I like yes. that kit. Um, Agreed. Be- At least beyond it's not that. blue. Abby, At do you have it's eyes? Blue. That's- have, have you guys not <laughs> seen the roundup of the kits? They are all blue. Every single mm. one of them is blue. Like, at least there's no blue. I, I will give you that like much, but I will not give it. you that. I like it. <laughs> Forest green and fluorescent yellow is just wild. It's a great um, combo. Final question as well. Um, do we think that Roglic is going to add to his Telemark celebration and do like the flapping Wat Van Art wings? On the podium, flapping, so is he gonna have to? Is he gonna have to? Telemarker, I mean, a flapping a telemarker, telemarker yeah. just gone off a cliff. <laughs> yeah, the, t- the telemarker, <laughs> yeah, trying, t- trying not to in flip danger. over forward. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, to answer your question seriously, Kaylee, I, I think they will be a big, big team in a couple of years to come, but they will be going by an entirely different name. They will have entirely different staff, probably running the thing, and probably a lot of changes it, it, what i'm trying to say is it'll probably be unrecognizable from bora Hansgrove last year to bora bulls four years from there or or rb bora or whatever they're going to bora be bulls <laughs> wow i hope their kits look All like right. a can you know i hope it's that would just, um, pretty sweet yeah like a silvery i, I hope cool alfa tari makes their kit mm. kind of cool all right we're taking a quick break Welcome back, everybody. Final segment today. We're going to do some New Year's resolutions for the sport of cycling. So let's say the sport of cycling was a, a single entity, was a person, what that person's New Year's resolution would be. I've asked the three of you for, we've got, we've got so one earnest resolution and one that's maybe a little bit less feasible. Ronan. I think cycling should join a gym, quit smoking, go traveling, maybe get a better job. Um, <laughs> all the, all, yes, be open to love. Um, 
I don't know. Shave their yeah, beard. All, all the usual ones. No, joking aside, I I have a few. Uh, you give us a bit of heads up on this, so I came up. I came up with three. Um, and the first one I'm going to give you is I'm going to say that cycling should try to communicate better in 2024, and I mean that from both the sort of tech and industry side of things, where um, I no longer want to have to wonder if these tires are going to blow off this rim because are these tires hookless compatible? Are these rims hookless? Uh, all, all of those questions. So. I think the industry needs to communicate better. And I think, I hope that the writers will have heard Matty Mohoric's press conference in the Tour de France when he won the stage last year and will aim to communicate better in 2024 and give us much more of those types of interviews rather than, eh, the legs were good, the sensations were good, the usual stuff that we've had for the last 70 years. So that, that's my first one, communicating better. Like better like press training? I think that would be a good one. No, I want no training. I want mm. them just to be no training. Themselves. You want them de trained. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I want de-trained. them de trained. Yeah. I think that's I think that's a really valid one. We, we we do forget, I think, that actually cycling is a lot better than other sports on this front. Like when was the last time you heard anything interesting being said by one of the big ball sports athletes? Right? Like almost nothing. And mm. at least we do get as journalists, we get a lot better access to these riders. But it is nonetheless frustrating. I like that one, Ronan. I like it a lot. Who wants to go next? I can go next. In in all seriousness, I would hope that in the future, cycling tries to hold on to the women that retire. Um, I'd like to see more women in management and such roles. Jaco Alula Liv just announced that Jess Allen, who retired at the end of 2023 um, and has been on that team, I think her whole she spent her whole career with the Green Edge organization that she will be standing in as DS a bit for their new development team, which is phenomenal. I want to see more stuff like that. I want to see the women who have spent time in the sport and understand the sport and understand what the sport needs to improve and where the sport is doing well to stay in the sport and help it grow. We kind of have two examples on opposite ends of the spectrum for this, right? Like we kind of, we have EF on one side, uh, which has hired a bunch of, of women to run it, including you know former pros like Carmen Small, who's going to be their head sports director and things like that. And then on the other side, we have the Yumbo Lisa bike just got rid of all the women that were involved in it and is now run by some dude. So uh, we can look into 2024 and see which which model works better, perhaps. And I think we know which direction we're going to go. We're going to do a little A-B testing. <laughs> a little A-B testing. A-B testing misogyny. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> There's another option for the podcast title today. Little A-B test. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Johnny, you got one for us? Yeah, I've got two. Um, the first one is is quicker and more lighthearted. New Year's resolution to get rid of second group syndrome and everyone to race for the win, or at least the win within their group, and to not be content with finishing fourth or second. Because... At some point, everyone's going to get to the end of their life, and if they've come second in a race, it's not going to hit the same as potentially winning it. So just race for the win. I incentivize that. Like, I think that's kind of the point of the somewhat silly UCI point system, right? That, like, 12th gets you a whole bunch of points, and they're trying to get... So you're all or nothing. So the only people that get points are the winners. Maybe second and third. Second and third are not allowed on podiums. And second and third (laughs) have to do, uh, like, double the length of press conference. I, th- I think the opposite, Johnny. We need we need second and third, like top three podiums for like, because at the moment you want to stay to the Tour de France, you only get on, you, only the winner gets on the podium. Do we want a ten deep podium? Mm. Maybe five. I, I was going to say three, but I'll, I'll meet you in the middle there. I'll be able to say five. I just we could do a masters racing I, I style where we we split up the same race into into age categories. So like Primoz Roglic <laughs> and Tadej Pogacar are no longer racing each other, <laughs> and they could both win. Oh, more win. So like um. So like sports day, everyone gets a medal. Yeah. That could also work. Well, so I, I, guess, <laughs> I guess the underlying question is to succeed in your resolution, is it everybody gets a medal or nobody gets a medal is better? I don't know. Maybe punishment for coming second to 10th. <laughs> I don't know. I just can't do another season of watching people just give up. Like it's all of these pros work so hard and are so talented. You know, this is coming from the perspective of never having done any of this, but... Just go for the win, like winning. What's that? Um, 
in uh, Talladega Nights, Will Ferrell. It's if you ain't first, you're yeah, last. First, you're last. You should be a DS, Johnny. Just go and be like, all right, guys, we're just going to race for the best yeah. position that we can get today. I'll say like, look, okay, we've <laughs> got, we've got our, our sponsors are tied in for the next five years. As long as you spend this whole season racing for the win and not settling for second place, then I will renew all of you. The only way you can get, the only way that you get told off is if you like don't pull in that second group. And then my second one is um, a New Year's resolution to stop with cycling sort of obsession with like moral panic and what what aboutism. Like anytime something happens, like if there's a horrible crash or like an incident, the same ones we have every year, all that seems to happen is everyone's just like, we need to change things. We guys, we need to change change and improve and then nothing happens and it feels like everyone just sort of that talks that could just and... be a worldwide yeah but that's that's too everything. that's too much though that's like too much like yeah i just feel like there's there's so much hand wringing that goes on and often like we we spend time talking about on the podcast and i don't know the ebb and flow of like losing out over people's hand positions on the bike or unless you're spitting it's okay to have moral panic about spitting ronan do we have a do we have a uh, hand position based New Year's resolution well, for me. I mean, when you asked us to do this, I started looking into like what are the most popular resolutions, and mm. uh, I already gave you some there in my first one. But the the other ones I come up to come up with that may be relevant to pro cycling were listen to more podcasts, specifically this one. Uh, so that that would be a good one for all pro cycling to do. Monetize your hobby would be a nice one for world tour teams to do. So uh, actually, you know, going back to our Red Bull conversation there about earlier, if they could if they could do that, that would be good. Oh, uh, gotta have that grind set. Sticking to your resolutions was another thing, which partially gets me to the, the, what you're hinting at there. The final one I came up with was learn a new hobby. And I thought the UCI specifically could take on that one. And actually the new hobby could be actually applying their rules. Um, Doing their jobs. So mm. I'm, I'm being a bit harsh there. I just had to find some way to sort of segue into, there's a lot of talk about UCI rules all the time. There's a lot of talk, obviously, of late about inward angled levers. Before that, it was talk about increased fines for breaking certain rules. Before that, it was sock height. Before it, on and on and on. What I would just like to see in twenty twenty four is I'm okay with the UCI bringing in new rules, but either bring them in and apply them, or don't bring them in. Is sort of what I'm getting at. To give one example, sorry, the one that always touched in there for me is like how White Van Art can have his chain lubricated from a moving vehicle, which is. <laughs> breaking at least two UCI rules in the closing stages of one of the biggest spring classics and just nothing be done about it. So either do away with that rule or apply your rules. Do you think you're the last person on earth still being kept up by that that happening? Yes. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> definitely. I think every other person on earth Forgot. probably had forgotten that it happened. <laughs> What's yours, Kaylee? I have one news resolution uh, which solves many of yours, which is to remove team buses and go back to riders just like changing in the back of cars. Tiny camper vans. Nope, no camper vans. No no hiding away. That's the whole thing. This is like back to rank amateurism. The reason I say this, and I think I mentioned this on a podcast previously, maybe at the Rio Olympics, I was covering the Rio Olympics and there were no, there were no buses at, at the Rio Olympics at the start line. Like everyone just showed up in these kind of small crappy cars that had been given to the national teams by the Olympics. You know, you've got like Chris Froome just chilling in the back of a car. He can't escape and you can just go up and stick a microphone in his face and talk to him. No hiding in the buses. No sort of like barrier between the press and the riders and nowhere to hide. And it was great. I loved it. And as a result, got a bunch of really good conversations out of that particular morning. Maybe it's not mo- no buses all the time, but the occasional no bus race and where it- we as journalists get basically unfettered access to the riders because we're not scary. We just want to talk to them. We just want to hang out and chat, right? We're not scary at all. And we can just have a good conversation and they can't run away. Maybe that's what I want. Maybe they're introverts. I, that, that's too bad. <laughs> so me. <mean. laughs> <laughs> I, I love it because it, it gets directly to my communicating better resolution. So we're yeah. actually helping pro cycling to stick to their resolutions. I want to do correct. I, I do want to correct you on one thing though, and that is that Chris Room can escape. He just needs to go to escapecollective.com forward slash join <laughs> and sign up now. 
simple. That was smooth. That was really quite well done. <laughs> Plug right God, on. Ronan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, we've got some resolutions for Pro Cycling for 2024. I have one, I have one more. And it, gets <gasps> oh, to your boss. It, it also ties into your boss. I also oh, have yeah. one more, Bonus. but I feel like that was a great ending. Bonus resolution. No, no, we could do, we could do bonus resolutions here. No, how about this? How about this? We were talking about this uh, over Slack in the last couple of weeks, and we were trying to decide what we could do for <laughs> members and frequent listeners of, of Placeholder Podcast. Because, you know, we've got like members only podcasts like Performance Process that you do, Ronan, but doing the same thing for placeholders feels a bit weird. So here's what we're going to do. If you are a member and you're listening on the member feed, this podcast is going to keep going and you're going to get our extra resolution. But if you are not a member and you're listening on the free feed, this is the end of the podcast right here. Sorry to say. Bye. Head over to escapecollective.com slash join and you can sign up and then you'll get an email with how to get access to the member feed and you'll be good to go. Now we can give the resolutions that we really mean. The ones, the no hold barred, what we actually think. Now we do spicy resolutions. Spicy Spicy resolutions coming up. All right. So if you're not a, uh, a member of Escape Collective, thank you for joining us today. We really loved having you on the other side of the internet for this podcast. And we are now... We're closing the gates. Going to go talk to our members. We're closing the gates. We'll see you next week. 